I don't know why my very sacrilegious mind goes to a famous iconic movie and the line from one theologian, John Belushi, we're putting the band back together. <laughs> and remember, for those of you that have seen that classic, they were on a mission from God. You know that. They were on a mission from God. So let's continue in an attitude of prayer here this morning. God, we are so grateful. What a privilege to come into the house of worship this morning. What a blessing to be able to enter into your presence with these types of praises, the words that we sing. You are great. How great you are. And Father, that you are the type of God that turns graves into gardens. You bring beauty from ashes. And this morning, as we continue looking at these powerful red-letter words from the Sermon on the Mount, may you speak to us in our hearts. God, uh, uh, there is no chance that we could have this many people assembled here this morning, and there wouldn't be one or two of us struggling with doubt on a God that we can't see, on a God that we can't touch, doubt toward, can we really, really place our hope our faith, and our trust completely in you. And God, may you all the more, through the power of your holy scriptures, move in our hearts and bring us to a faith that is all yet stronger because of the cross, because of the gospel, because of the good news. And God, we celebrate it here this morning. Thanks for this church. Thanks for the table before us. Thanks for the ways you bless us and love us. May you continue to lead in this service in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. And amen. So picking up there with our series on the Sermon on the Mount, beginning this morning, we will look at a reading from Matthew's Gospel. If you have your Bibles, you can go there. We're again back in Matthew chapter 5. We will begin with verse 33 and reading initially here verses 33 through 37. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king David. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say then simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Let's stop for a moment here, and before we press on, let's take a look at what Jesus was trying to portray here, the rote definition for an oath is a solemn promise, often invoking a divine witness. Oaths were a very common practice in the old covenant agreements. And then Jesus comes along and says, let your word be your word. Let your word be your bond. Let your words be always simply true. Let your character speak for itself. And how many of us long to be the kind of person where this may be our story? We're living in this day and age when words are flying everywhere in every conceivable media stream that we could possibly ever imagine. The Proverbs 19 verse 10, verse 10 say simply this, where many words are present, sin is never absent. Think about that in the day in which we live. Where many words are present, sin is never absent. But our lives are saturated with words flying at us from all directions. I've seen two more than provocative billboards recently. One last night driving on the tollway and one earlier in the week. There's one on the Dan Ryan Expressway that I think Rick has brought to my attention. It says, in Chicago, abortion is health care. Maybe some of you have seen it. 
And then, last night, on the 294, it says, all men will die, but not all men will truly live. And I'll let you do the research on what's being advertised there. But I will tell you this, it's not a church. It's not a church. Be a great motto tied to the gospel, but it's far from a house of worship. Let's pick up with verses 38 through 42. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not risk, resist the one who's evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to him the other also, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So when Jesus, over and over again in this teaching, references the Old Testament, by saying, you have heard that it was said. He's going back to quotes from Exodus. He's going back to quotes from Leviticus. He's going back to quotes from Deuteronomy and the law. You've heard that it was said. And Jesus then says, but remember, this new covenant is different. So these words some 2,000 years ago on a mountainside are played out in our everyday parlance, right? How many of us have heard people, not necessarily gospel folks, not necessarily Christian believers, use that terminology? Hey, turn the other cheek. Hey, go the extra mile. It's straight from the book. And it's often used by people that have no clue that these are words of Jesus. And in today's hyper-individualistic culture, the difference is tangible and noticeable when we live this way. These are reflections of gospel-changed people. Think about this. When people who know you and people who know me say, that's the type of person that when they see a need, they strive to meet it. This church impresses me. It's impressed me from a distance before I was even involved here more. But I know the heart of this church is when we see a need, we strive to meet it. That's the gospel. That's being tangibly different. When we can be a people who are known as simply letting our words be our mantra of life in truth, not because we are so good, but because we know the one who declares himself as the truth. Jesus says the truth isn't something abstract that we strive for. Jesus says, I am the truth. And when you are a people of truth, and we're a people of integrity, and we're, we are a people that say, wow, when someone strikes me, it might not be a physical blow. What if it's a verbal blow? Am I ever able to really turn the other cheek? And what does it look like in my life for me to truly go the extra mile? And again, I use this terminology, hyper-individualism. I heard someone really, really smart, knows much more about the Bible than me, has written some books, recently say, don't lose sight of what we're living in today. Because this individualism is at a new and heightened level like we've never seen before. And part of it is driven by our social media world. Hyper-individualism is what's driving people away from this gathering on Sunday mornings. Hyper-individualism is what's taking people away from this book. Because when we read this book, and when we hear the declaration from the Apostle Paul that, by the way, your life is not your own, that your life was bought at a price, 
That's not the message in America 2024. We're not our own. We are bought at a price. Be a people who turn the other cheek, who give away the extra coat, and who go the extra mile. The last portion of our teaching this morning comes from verses 43 through 48. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and you shall hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your neighbors or love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those only who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Now even this statement here, don't even the lousy, no good, lowest of the low tax collectors do that? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than anyone else, than all the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Wow. There's a teaching for the Jews. They're backhanding the Gentiles. Do not even the lowly Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, why would Jesus use a distinctive toward the Gentiles? Not because he had something against the Gentiles, but he did it because he knew his audience thought that way. So what's it mean when Jesus says, be perfect then, as your heavenly Father is perfect? The standard of this book, the standard of the canon of Scripture, to me, every time I read it, doesn't remind me of how perfect I am. Does it remind you of how perfect you are? So why would Jesus say to his followers, be perfect then, as your heavenly Father is perfect? I don't believe that this is saying that we can live our lives in perfection. But what does a perfect follower of Jesus look like? You can be a perfect follower of Jesus in that you know that everything that you have is not really yours, that everything that you have is really his. That's part of being a perfect follower of Jesus. Knowing that every good and perfect gift that we have is from above, that's part of trying to live a perfect life following Jesus. What about the reality that when I think that my world needs more comfort, more safety, and more security? Is that living in the perfection that Jesus calls us to? Over and over and over again, how about this passage, especially this final segment that we just read? When you only love those who love you, what reward do you have? And when we could somehow be a people that follow the red letter words of Jesus and we literally, literally pray for our enemies, you know what this passage truly is screaming at you and me this morning? Be different. Look different. Look gospel different. And what if we didn't mind if people said in their misunderstanding of what Christianity really is, are we okay with someone maybe saying those people are a little odd? They might even use words like weird, right? Who wants to be called that really? Who wants to be referred to that way really? Do you want to say this sweet lady that works in the post office over here, you walk in, she's a little weird. No. But how about this? Something about her is different. I really can't put my finger on it, but something about her is different. And when people see you and me as different, and when they ever are bold enough to say, or perhaps ask the question directly, what is it about you that makes you so different? We have elders in this church who go to work every day in hostile environments. They go to work in places where some of the hardest 
people on the planet are living. They go to places where, like construction sites, guys aren't always kind and genteel and talking about loving their enemies. And you know what I've seen from this church, from the leadership of this church? That there is a marked distinction by the leaders, the lay leaders of this church, that they want to look like salt and light in this world. When Jesus opened this teaching, he said, be salt and light. And by the way, this is what it starts to look like. When we are gospel different, we're being salt and light. And I don't know how many of us, when we get up in the morning and we say, hey, Lord, today, help me be different. Implicit here in our culture today is that we should be a people who naturally choose sides. It is completely acceptable to say that we understand that our culture today needs to be polarized because those, to use the language of our hour, is there are those on the right and those on the left. Have you heard that language? Those on the right think this way. Those on the left think this way. Well, there's a story in red letters as well in Matthew's Gospel later in chapter 25. And let me tell you what that right and left looks like. It's important for us to get this. Because in that scene, in the throne room of heaven scene, where Jesus is setting the table, think about this. The right and the left are discussed in these ways. Those on the right, the sheep, are going to a Christ-filled heavenly eternity. Those on the left, not the political left, those on the left, the goats, are going to an eternal damnation, a real hell that Jesus teaches about. And he's setting the table here earlier in Matthew's gospel, screaming out to his followers in a polarized culture, be different. When we show true love for people who've hurt us, people who have wronged us, maybe even betrayed us. This is the gospel on display. When we never lose sight of that which Jesus, via the cross, has done for us, then we can have the grace quotient exemplified in our dealings with the not easily lovable people whom God has somehow placed in our paths. In just a few moments, a couple of the elders are going to come forward, and we have set before us the table, his holy communion table. I want us this morning, as we take the elements and we go back to our seats, there will be some music played underneath this time. I want us to take a few extra moments because as we talked earlier here this morning in the church, when we're trying to preach through, teach through the Sermon on the Mount, these very direct words of Jesus, there is no doubt a conviction that should rest on the believer. There is no doubt a challenge to be some other way than the way of the world. So this morning as we come forward and we pick up from this holy communion table, may we take a few moments back in our seats and just reflect and pray, Lord, what would it mean for my life to truly look gospel different? Amen? Let's pray. God, we are a people this morning that look at your holy scriptures and realize that it's um, called the canon of scripture for a reason. We look at this book and remember that of all the writings that were going on in that day, you in miraculous ways have ordained that these words would be ours 
for life and for godliness. Father, that these holy, holy teachings would help us to say it's calling us to be perfect in somehow, some way, Father. We know we're far from perfect. And yet we do know that we can try our best to perfectly follow you in a very imperfect world. God, we confess here this morning, there are some of us that are dealing with addictions. And may the teachings of this book help us to break free from addictions. Our holy God, we are here this morning holding on to pain and suffering and anger and unforgiveness for things that have happened in our past. May we this morning contemplate because of the power of the cross, the power of the gospel, the power of our risen Savior, may we be able to say we can let go of some past pain and some past hurts and begin to heal because you've called us to that. Father, can we this morning ask ourselves in a reflective way, do people who know me know my yes to be yes and my no to be no? Father, may you move in our hearts as we remember, as you called us to remember, as we take communion, that as a communal people, as a community of believers, we can become each day all the more sanctified, not because of our good works, but because we are remembering the overcoming work of Jesus via the cross and rising up from the grave. And God, we celebrate this morning that you are that God that brings beauty from ashes. May you do it in our lives and in our individual hearts this morning. We commit it to you, our holy God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The elders will come.